Greetings, my name is Godiva, Countess of Mercia. I lived and died more than 900 years ago. I rode the horse through the market of the town without my royal robes, without my gold and jewels. I persuade my husband Leofric to remove the burden of tax. This day, I am very happy that we have something very special in Coventry to celebrate. A thousand years of our city, the feast day of Osberga, and the unveiling of our tapestry. Working with many generations, multi-generational, from the youngest child to some of our senior citizens, we have worked to produce something special for everyone to enjoy. From the beginning of Coventry, from the Copas tree, right through to our present day and our future, our children, we want to celebrate with everyone and take the tapestry with us, and it will travel, maybe, to you. The tapestry was made possible because of the Godiva Trust. The Godiva Trust was formed some years ago so that the work of Lady Godiva will reach out to the world to actually take the story of Coventry out and the story of Godiva and all the things surrounding Godiva about social justice, about women, about different faiths and cultures so that together we can make the story of Coventry travel. wanted to make sure we could celebrate Coventry's thousand years and it started with a woman and then from her Godiva, from Godiva, the church, from the church, the pilgrims, from the pilgrims of trade and the monasteries and the guilds and how Coventry became the golden years and how many people wanted to be here and how they had to make a wall to keep everything in and then unfortunately the reformation and dissolution and then the Civil War, the 20th century, had made such a difference from industry and from being where it was, the centre, the centre of England, and how that destruction didn't keep the people down, as if the phoenix has always risen, and how the universities have now made some wonderful things happen in education for our city, and how a great future we can have together. Well, the first initial meeting was uh, quite exciting, all the ideas that Prue had. We worked through these first initial ideas and then put it into a kind of a design layout. And the next thing really was to try and get as many people on board as possible. Well, we attended the meeting and met Jane Morgan, who's the artist in charge of the project. And we got some information about what the proposal was for thousand year um, history of Coventry, obviously broken down into a series of panels. So we came up with a, a sort of collection of um, woven pieces that have been done by various members of the group um, and we've brought them together to sort of do a representation of the Weaver's House, one of which is um, a beautiful tapestry weaving replica that um, Beryl has done. When we first said about Beryl doing the Weaver's House, that we thought that was our, going to be our contribution because we thought there'd be <laughs> other people who were doing things from that century in Coventry. So perhaps Pex would like to say how yeah. no, it came about now. Well, the thing is, what I particularly like about this piece of work, and it is a piece of artwork, is that the, the different methods of weaving that's been used throughout. This here is a replica made by Margaret of a drop spindle. Now a drop spins, oh, you know, it spins, that's what it does, it spins the wool. So we represented that here, then there's dyeing, of course. This is one of the few buildings, few medieval working men's houses, 
which you can get an enter into and get an idea of what it was like to live 500 years ago. It was built in 1454 by the monks from Coventry Priory for the weavers and the dyers, i.e. the people who were involved in the clothing industry. This is a replica of a medieval narrow loom. The warp thread is round round a back roller over there and it runs through the heddle bars and loops through here to the finished roller at the front here. But the first thread might go through this beam here, second thread, third thread, fourth thread, fifth thread, all the way across. And through the shed is thrown the shuttle from one side very quickly normally to the other and then the loose thread is beaten up against the finished cloth the height of the pedal bars are changed by the pedals underneath like that so what were the upper threads now become the lower threads, the lower threads become the upper threads, and you can throw the shuttle back through. And as I say, it is on machines like this that Coventry's wealth was based. It was at one stage the fourth richest city for taxation purposes. And all the buildings we are surrounded by today were built with the profits of the wool industry. The city wall, the cathedrals, the monasteries, many of the buildings around us, including St Mary's Guildhall, literally close to where we're standing now. This is the, called the Lady Mayoress's Parlour, and it's a lovely room. Now it's not used as that, now when they're entertaining or people getting ready to perform on the uh, dais there, they would get ready here. If it's a big dinner, the special guests would be brought in from this room and then the people waiting would clap them in and then they'd walk into that room. And of course when... Um the new Lord Mayor is inaugurated, these are carried into the, uh, Coventry Cathedral mm. um, as well. So very, very special things associated with mm. Coventry. If you see a building with lots of oak panels, you know that that person is very wealthy. If you see less oak and more wattle in between, they didn't have as much money. So this was showing how rich and opulent this place was. In 1381, uh, a Carthusian prior, head monk obviously of the Carthusian order, uh, decided he wanted to establish a Carthusian monastery, or convent as he would have called it, uh, in Coventry. And Coventry in medieval times was of course an extremely important city, one of the, the third or fourth most important city in, in the country. The Carthusians started in Chartreuse, near Grenoble in France, and us English couldn't say Chartreuse, so it became Charterhouse. And now, all the way around the world, uh, Carthusian monasteries are called Charterhouses. Carthusian monks live a life quite voluntary, of complete solitude. They don't speak to each other, they don't uh, meet each other except for prayers in the church. Uh, occasionally they eat together, but even then there'd be somebody reading so that they couldn't talk to each other. The refectory wall, which went straight up to the ceiling, was then painted with, with uh, a medieval wall painting, huge painting. Um, very little of it is left, but what is left is so important because it's the only Car English Carthusian wall painting of its time. So it's the only one which tells us anything about their beliefs and, and what they would have done. And it, uh, it's a crucifixion. It's only the bottom half of, of Christ's legs that can be seen. Uh, because the rest is gone, but uh, it did as include angels um, collecting the blood um, flowing from his, the wounds in his feet. In another room we've got a painting that was put there at the time of Robert Dudley. Um, it's got a little motto saying about the glory of God and the glory of the scriptures, just to make sure that Elizabeth knew that he wasn't one of the sinful people that she had found in Coventry, because she did come and and admonish the people of Coventry for, for losing their faith. But it's a beautiful, beautiful painting in black and white. The black um, 
looks almost fresh in some parts, but almost as if it was painted yesterday, because it's painted in tempera, and it's, 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 some parts of it are as fresh as ever. On the top floor, um, we've also got uh, yet another painting, a bit more modern, <laughs> has a, a bit more modern, it's still a few hundred years old, but it's, there's, a, there's some colour in this one, and it's, uh, it's a bit later, and painted in the Italian style. Paintings of that time very often had uh, puzzles and enigmas painted into them. Uh, and ours is no exception. It has a, a cartouche which nobody can read. There's at least one Latin word in it, I think, and, and an old French word probably, but the, the uh, script has gone round the world and linguists have tried and so, but it, so far nobody's come up with a, uh, a satisfactory explanation of what it says. But there is the remnants of a cartouche um, on the other side of the same painting and possibly there were four panels, there's now only two. And if you had them all, maybe that would help to solve the puzzle and you could put them all together. But we'll never know because we've got so little of it left. Pottery could also produce very high quality cloth and it was well known for its high quality cloth. It was also very famous for producing a blue dye which is where we get the saying, true as Coventry blue from. Because the dye which Coventry used didn't fade and stayed fast. Sarah dyed this with woad to make Coventry blue, as near as we can. I hasten to add. <laughs> Coventry, and this was also woven by Sarah. So that starts here. This is the plant that the woad comes, this is the woad plant with the leaves uh, and the root. And the woad used for the Coventry cloth was actually imported from the Mediterranean. But we, we do, do have some But here. we have got examples of it, yeah. This is obvious, <laughs> too. As True, Coventry, as Coventry blue. blue, it's yeah. lovely. Now, these pieces here are what we call weaving sticks. So this was made with odd pieces of, well, recycled really wool, yarn, to represent this, the garden. Wow, it looks terrific. So that is different, uh, just using different colours. This is obviously a vegetable patch, you can tell. And this is, I think, various people have done things. This here, the path, has been done by using a Lucette loom, which is a very simple loom. These uh, stick weaving, so it's very fine. The, the lady, Debbie, that did this, very, very fine little twigs, and she wove it to represent a fence, which you can see here. Yeah. We wanted to do something on the, the growth of industry in Coventry, and immediately what came to mind was. Um, Gustav Klimt's tree where it's sort of where it's growing and then Maureen came up with the idea of these what are called wrapped threads which are these here mm. which give um, you know lovely sort of textural surfaces. Mm. You might and you might not have come across the um, original tree of life but it's the tree of industry the growth of industry and then we're going to have embroidered across the top the growth of industry and somebody's doing that um, in cross stitch so we've got yet another aspect to our work it's wonderful. then it was sort of adding things on mm -hmm. and some important research which Maureen and um, Julie did was to look at the industry in country over you know many decades and research and find the images but also we decided that the one unifying fact really was the wheel or the cog or springs curly whirly things so that's why we've got a lot of these parts of uh, watches and clocks which we're, in, we're going to incorporate on the design. Back in 1850, in Coventry, the major industries were silk ribbon weaving and also watchmaking. 
there was also a thriving sewing machine manufacturing industry going on when a certain chap called Rowley Turner came to Coventry to visit his uncle who had the Coventry sewing machine company and he was riding one of these. This is a velocipede or over in this country we call them a bone shaker because it was a solid wheel on a solid uh, iron rim. No pneumatic tyres, they came along a lot later. So it was a bit of a bumpy rough ride to say the least. His uncle was really, really taken with his Velocipede bone shaker and thought, I can make this a little better. So he took it into his workshop, started thinking about how he could make improvements on this bicycle. And that is where the transport revolution really, really began. So here we are. This is it. This is the Rover Safety Cycle, designed and invented by John Kemp Starley, arguably the most important invention of modern history. He actually designed this in 1888 in Coventry. As you can see, you have two wheels of identical diameter with a single cog going from the crank here at the bottom with a crossbar, handlebars, also with a paddle spoon brake. But the thing with this is, is you have two wheels of identical diameter. This is the blueprint for practically every bicycle made today. And this was back in 1888. And when you think about it, the first mass-produced motor cars in Coventry rolled off the production line at the Daimler Works in 1896, which means there was this 12-year gap between John Kemp Starley's safety cycle of 1888 and then the first motor car, 1896, just 12 years. The, the innovation was staggering, really, really, very quick, amazing. But this is it, the Rover safety cycle, the most important invention in modern times. When it comes to the 20th century, what made Coventry famous was, of course, the industry here. Mostly that was car manufacturing. It wasn't just cars, it was buses, it was lorries, it was airplanes. There was a whole range of things being made here part of the 20th century. And when we got to the 1920s, 1930s, some of the big names. You think of Maudsley, for instance. They were making marine engines, they were making buses, they were making vehicles, cars. And, but then we started making airplanes, and not a lot of people seem to realise this. And when you think of planes like the Whitney Bomber, which is the pre-Lancaster Bomber of World War II, that was designed and built in Coventry, as were Mosquitoes, as were Lancasters, and a whole range of planes. And I believe the last planes assembled here were jump jet harriers, of which one is in Coventry University. Frank Whittle, one could say, is one of the most important people in terms of the, the modern world in which we live. He was the inventor of the jet engine and he was born in Coventry, Nailstone, in 1907. He changed his name to join the RAF uh, and do his training as an apprentice. By the late 1920s he had a proposal to put forward to the RAF and what he'd realised very early on is propeller planes were not a way of, of providing sustainable air travel for the future uh, and he saw the future in, in jet engines. What he um, wanted to do was create a, a motor jet engine as he called it and this replaced a piston uh, with a turbine and a tur the turbine was a much more efficient way of collecting the energy from the exhaust and actually running the engine. Now the RAF thought this was a very volatile and dangerous kind of invention and they weren't convinced by it so they turned it down. Uh, Frank Whittle actually painted the idea in 1930, so he was the official inventor of it, uh, and he formed a company with colleagues uh, called the um, called Powerjet uh, Company in the 1930s. And uh, what actually happened was, by 1940, he'd actually managed to create an engine that went into an aircraft called the Gloucester. And when they tested it, they found that it outperformed Spitfire, which of course was the great plane of the Second World War, and went up to 350 miles an hour and could climb up to 25,000 feet. That very same year of 1940, he met um, the main uh, contacts from Rolls-Royce company. And of course, from them, 
uh, his involvement with them led to the development of the Rolls-Royce jet engine that uh, powers so many of our planes to the current day. So that was the crucial moment. And uh, Frank Whittle was a commentary lad, born and bred. But um, in uh, 1944, he got an MBE for his work. Churchill had actually seen his work in, in action. Uh, and his company, Powerjets uh, Limited, actually became a nationalised company in 1946. Richard Noble um, had um, an inspiration, an idea to create the world's uh, fastest car on land, to, to beat the land speed record. And he understood that Whittle's engine was the key to doing this. In 1972, he created a car called Thrust One, which actually had um, a Rolls-Royce Derwin 8 engine in it. And it was a lorry chassis. It was a bit of a hotchpotch of a machine. Uh, very, very dangerous as it turned out. Um, in 1974, it actually overturned and was completely written off uh, at the speed of 140 miles an hour. So, not an illustrious beginning for Richard Noble, but the key thing was he learnt a lot from that and he got a lot of sponsors. This led to Thrust 2. Um, Richard Noble got together with a designer called John Aykroyd um, to create what was effectively um, a vehicle with aerodynamic design to it, uh, but designed to obviously travel uh, on land. The engine that uh, Richard Noble chose for Thrust 2 was a Rolls-Royce um, Avon 210 engine, which came out, um, actually was, was the engine that was used by an English um, electric lighting uh, supersonic jet. So it was, it was quite a, a, an ambitious thing to do, to attach this to a car on land. The record that Richard Noble had to break was that held by the Americans, and that and the last speed record at that time, um, the 1980s, was 622 miles per hour. Actually, Thrust 2 very quickly gained the British um, uh, land speed record um, at Greenham Com Common, actually on an airfield there. But unfortunately, there was nowhere in the UK that was really big enough area of flat land for him to, to excel more than about 220 miles an hour. So he had to go to America to uh, try out Thrust 2 there. So in, in 1982 1983, Richard Noble um, uh, was driving um, this, he was the actual person in the car, driving Thrust 2 at Bonville Flats. And what happened was that they had a lot of rain and the, and the ground flooded and it just stopped them from actually being able to achieve the land speed record. So they came back uh, a second year and uh, failed again because of rain. And the ground was quite damp there, so the best speed they could get was about 620, tantalisingly close to the American speed record. Back in 1983, Richard Noble came back with his crew uh, to Black Rock Desert, and uh, there they um, managed to achieve um, speeds of, of around 620 again. And then the designer, John Aykroyd, realised that actually if they drove the car at the hottest time of day, when the speed of sound was at its fastest, this would uh, deal with the transonic um, uh, resistance they were getting on the car. So they did that, and that's when they actually uh, beat the record. And the record was set at over 633 miles per hour as an average on two, two runs in the desert. So 14 years later, Richard Noble decided he was going to try and break the record that was still held at that stage by Thrust 2. Um, and the thing was, to actually get a faster speed car, he had to increase the power of the car considerably. And uh, Thrust SSC actually had 100,000 uh, horsepower uh, driving it. It's quite uh, remarkable. Thrust SSC had a Rolls-Royce Spey 202 um, engine in it, which is the engine that was used actually in a uh, Phantom uh, 2 jet fighter. So um, the Spey engine was actually a very, very uh, reliable engine. This is one of the reasons it was picked. It was very robust, it was a very simple engine, and it was very, very reliable. The power of the car meant that it actually could go to 0 to 600 in 16 seconds, uh, which was actually a faster acceleration than Concorde uh, on, on the ground. On the 15th of October 1997, Thrust SSC smashed the land speed record. Uh, with a speed of 766 miles per hour. The speed that Trust uh, SSC had gone at actually had broken the sound barrier, um, and it was over Mach 1, which is the speed of sound. It was said by observers when they were watching Trust SSC that um, at the time that Trust um, SSC was doing its successful run, 
it went very, very quiet. And the reason for this is there was this build-up of sound around the no nose cone of the car. And actually, when it broke through the sound barrier, there was a sonic boom. It's the first time a land speed vehicle created a sonic boom on, on Earth. This is the place to be, really, as far as Coventry music is concerned. Uh, obviously, we are famous in Coventry for two-tone music, but there's far more to it than just that. We go right back to the Roman occupation. But I suppose the, uh, the, the biggest sort of standout and the most iconic starting point for Coventry and Warwickshire music would be the uh, Coventry Carol, which has been sung by so many people from all over the world. Obviously, two-tone music change the world you know uh, the black and white unite and stuff is, is still being talked about at the moment you know it's it's raised its head again obviously some of the uh, the issues that that came around at the time are, are coming around again the racial issues and two town was always there and still is here to uh, counteract that in a way uh, but two town music obviously uh, is the specials and the selector they were the commentary bands and it was of course uh, ska music a type of like reggae and uh, it was an infectious music but it also had a message which is really important of course and then moving right up to more present time you've got a band like the enemy who were a huge band unfortunately they've uh, announced their retirement after 10 years but that doesn't mean to say that their legacy should be forgotten and then of course you've got uh, people like Delia Derbyshire who created the Doctor Who theme and I think if she was alive now, she'd be Dame Delia Derbyshire. She's a, an absolute genius. We're standing now in this exhibition at the Herbert Art Gallery and Museum, which is called Making a Masterpiece. Um, and the exhibition looks at the process that uh, Graham Sutherland undertook when he was creating the tapestry that hangs behind the altar in Coventry Cathedral. Um, this was a major project for, for Graham Sutherland, who was you know, quite a significant uh, artist at the time that he was commissioned to undertake the project. Um, he, was, he was given the commission in 1951 by Spassel Spence, the architect of uh, Coventry Cathedral. And the brief was to create uh, a tapestry to hang behind the altar, which showed Christ in majesty, surrounded by symbols of the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And it was a project that absorbed Sutherland for a number of years. Um, it took 11 years from um, commissioning the, the, the tapestry for it to be actually completed and installed in the cathedral. And it occupied Sutherland throughout that period. He went through, the design process went through a number of changes. Um, he produced a huge number of, of sketches and drawings, some of which you can see in this exhibition as he was developing his ideas. He also produced three um, large-scale designs for the whole tapestry, two of which you can see uh, behind me. These show how his ideas changed throughout the period. When he finally completed his design, it was sent to a French company to actually be woven. Uh, this was a company called Panton Frere, and they were one of the few companies in the world who had a loom big enough to weave the tapestry. Because the completed tapestry is enormous, um, it measures somewhere in the region of 23 metres by 11 metres and there were very few companies that were able to do this. So it took, it took the company in France almost two years to actually weave the tapestry. And even during that time, Graham Sutherland's ideas about the design were changing, you know, so it was still constantly evolving. Um, but it was completed in uh, early 1962 um, and came to Coventry um, in March 1962 and was installed in the cathedral in time for the consecration of the cathedral, which took place in May 1962. The consecration ceremony was attended by Queen Elizabeth II, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of York, and many other significant people. Unfortunately, Graham Sutherland himself did not attend the consecration. His relationship with Basil Spence and with the cathedral had become strained as the, um, as the project developed. There were lots of different points of view on um, how the tapestry with the design was developing. And, and also, Graham Sutherland had wanted to, to hang the tapestry in, in Paris before it came to Coventry, just to make sure that everything was okay with it. Basil Spence and the cathedral authorities strongly disagreed with this, and they insisted that the tapestry came to Coventry and was hung here for the first time. 
So unfortunately, by the time the tapestry was installed and the cathedral consecration took place, relations, as I say, were somewhat strained. But Sutherland did come to, to see the tapestry installed uh, after the consecration. Um, so he did get to see uh, his, his design um, actually in, in the cathedral. Coventry is a great place to think about poetry because one of the 20th century's greatest poets, Philip Larkin, was born and educated in Coventry. And Coventry is mentioned in one of his famous poems, I Remember, I Remember. And there's a verse of that on Coventry Railway Station, actually outside the Customer Services Office on Platform One. But Coventry's had a much longer history of poetry and also a more recent one. So, as you'll know, Lady Godiva was a very famous local personality. And she was a subject of many, many poems, ballads, songs that would be sung year after year, especially at the time of a festival or a fair in her honour. But there have been famous poems by famous poets as well. So, for example, in 1840, Alfred Lord Tennyson came to Coventry. It was two years after the railway station had opened. And he actually starts a poem by saying, I waited for the train at Coventry. I stood with grooms and porters on the bridge. And then he goes on to say how, as he saw the three spires of the city of Coventry, he was reminded of the story of Godiva. And then he goes on to write this great long poem. And there are a few lines of that on the pedestal of the statue that's in the center of Broadgate. So that's another strong poetic connection. And strangely, and Chinese students particularly might be interested in this, um, around 1900, when the Chinese ambassador came to Coventry, I think for a Daimler car, because Daimler, the first um, production car manufacturer, was based in Coventry, on the, beside the canal. When the ambassador came to Coventry, he was met by the mayor. It wasn't a Lord Mayor then, but a mayor. And presumably councillors as well. And he amazed them, I'm sure, by immediately quoting the lines of the poet Tennyson, which was pretty clever because there was no Google in those days. Um, but I suppose it shows how famous Tennyson and his poetry was. I think I'm right in saying that Coventry Station is the only one, certainly in the UK, to be celebrated in poetry by two internationally known English language poets. You have the, the writers who are travel writers who've written about visiting Coventry, like H.V. Morton or, or, or J.B. Priestley, but there are also the writers who've spent periods of time in Coventry, and most notably that's George Eliot, who in fact was Mary Ann or Marian Evans, who had two periods in Coventry. She was um, born and raised in Warwickshire, but she attended school in Warwick Row, in the premises that are now Lovett's, the estate agents, in the 1830s. She had to leave because of her mother's illness, which proved to be a terminal illness. And then in 1841, I believe, she came back to Coventry with her father to actually live in the house, Bird Grove, which is at the corner of the Fosal Road and what's now George Eliot Road. There are all sorts of ways in which Coventry appears in the novels of George Eliot. So Middlemarch is almost certainly profoundly influenced by Coventry. And then, for instance, in Adam Bede, the, the court scene, scene where Hetty Sorrell um, is up for trial, occurs in a room which is exactly like the chamber in the council house and if you stand there and you read the description you just you just look round and you you see the description of the tapestry and the description of the gallery and and the armor and the windows and you know that that's what is in the writer's mind yeah, well at, at that time um the, the, there, was, there, was, there was the Belgrade Theatre that was doing some great stuff. I mean, uh, the Belgrade and the Belgrade that was a leading light as far as theatre and education at that time was concerned. They had a huge theatre and education team. They had a, a huge youth theatre, uh, and, uh, and they were doing some great shows here. Uh, it was a very, very vibrant place at the time. I, 
it was, it was a lovely place to come and, and play. Um, and, and of course Coventry Theatre was already, it was still there, it hadn't been knocked down. And they used to get, they used to be doing sort of summer seasons and Easter seasons and Christmas seasons and they would bring the stars in. Uh, fr uh, so they were still doing some really big stuff there. Um, and, and, and there was so many little things just popping up all around Coventry at the time. You know, Coventry is just, it's, there is no other, there's no other place like it. I mean, I've been coming back since 1980 regularly uh, and this will be the 22nd pantomime that I've written and directed for the Belgrade Theatre this year and uh, it'll be my 17th I think 17th dame that I've played here as well so I've been coming back quite a few years as well as coming back to perform and do other things um, it's such a such a, a it's 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 not the place because I think everyone will agree it's not a it's not the prettiest of places, Coventry, but it's the people. I come back for the people because they're so, it's such a, so vibrant here and, and robust. You know, no matter what gets thrown at Coventry people, they'll always come through it. They'll always make it work. And, you know, the Coventry, Coventry the, the city itself has taken a few batterings over the, the centuries, I suppose. And especially in, in near history as well, with the war and everything, it took such a bad train, and it keeps things keep happening to the, the city, but the the people keep brushing it off and coming back. And uh, they're they're a great bunch of people, Coventry people. They have great resourcefulness and very robust.